This is God's word. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. I will be reading from the NIV, the New International Version. You may follow along in a Bible or with the projection. Hear now God's word. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is, for it is written, it is mine to re- avenge. I will, re- I will repay says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Thanks be to God. Can we just kill the lights? Thanks. Um, I want to start with a simple... Okay, it's really dark. <laughs> That's okay. I want to start with a simple word association. Um, you know, actually, my face is better in darkness. So. Uh, I'm going to give you a word and just, uh, I mean, you know, shout out the, or say the first word that comes to mind. So it's word association, okay? Are you ready? All right, here we go. Here's the first word, okay? Word association. Everyone knows what this is. Here comes the first word. What's the first word that comes to your mind when uh... I... Okay. I heard a lot of things. Um, Let's go to the second word, all right? Let's see. What's the first word that comes to your mind when uh, we see... Why is someone laughing? (laughs) Let's move on. (laughs) All right? It, it, there's no test, by the way. There's no wrong answer, just in case. Like, okay. All right, let's go. I got a couple more and then one phrase. Hmm? Indifference. indifference. Okay. I heard Jesus. I heard indifference. All right. Um, one more. Did someone say perfect? Okay. It doesn't matter. I, I, I didn't need to hear the answer. I just want to sort of get you to think. One last thing. This is a phrase. What's the first word that comes to your mind? And just say it, say it out loud if you uh, can. Being church. Um, we're going to talk about being church. And these words that I sort of asked you to think about, they sort of fit in. But uh, um, we're going to start with, and really this is the end of our sermon series on uh, gospel-shaped worship. And it's really all about, so therefore, as uh, as we've talked about gospel-shaped worship, how does it all fit into being church? How, how do we get to be church? So let's uh, get into it, but first let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and to, once again, be led by you and to reflect upon your word. We pray, Lord, that uh, you now speak to us about what it means to be church. Uh, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What came to you when I, when I first mentioned being church? What picture? Uh, came to your mind and your heart. I don't know if you said it. What do you see? Do you see a building? Do you see people? Do you see a building with people? I mean, what does being church look like to us as we sort of imagine what that looks like? For Paul, being church might have come down to four key descriptions. Loving, redeeming, yet also instructing 
and challenging. Put it all together, and being church means living in it as the redeemed representative, as a community of representatives of Jesus Christ to a fractured uh, and a, a world stained with sin. I guess it's maybe the best way. It's sort of a churchy word, but the idea uh, that the Jews used to have is that stain is something that sins. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> sin is something that stains the other way around. And so that's uh, what Paul was thinking. And being church is what Paul des- describes in the conclusion of his letter to the church in Rome. And we read this in our passage in Romans chapter 15. I know there's 16 chapters in Rome, Rome uh, Romans, but actually chapter 15 is really the substantive end of that book. And the description is so, uh, sort of long, and so what we're going to do today is focus on two key points. So let's, let's start with the first one. Right? Paul begins by reminding us that being church must be about, and this is the big one, that uh, it's about uh, being church is being loving. Being church is being loving. He writes, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, honor one another above yourselves. And he says very similar things throughout uh, his other letters as well to various churches. Paul begins by saying, being church must be about being loving toward one another and being obviously loving toward God. But notice it is not just in any way, it's not just any kind of love. Paul tells us that love must be sincere. And and that's a very important word here. He says uh, love must be, let's do this, love must be sincere. Bad circle. Um, literally, that word sincere means anti-hypocritical. So what, what's he talking about? How is love supposed to be anti-hypocritical? As it turns out, Paul had very good reasons for saying this, and he had a very uh, important reason, uh, that the ch- uh, being church must be about being sincerely loving. Why? Because in the dominant Roman society, and remember, this is a letter to the church in Rome, This isn't just some self-identification. This is literally the church in Rome. So in the dominant Roman society of Paul's time, what you and I think of, and I ask you what's one of the words, what words did you think of when I said, you know, when I put up love? What came to you? Anyone? What word sort of came to, popped in your mind about love? Wife? Good answer. Anyone else? Wife is a good one. My wife is actually, a, it's a great answer. Because actually, that's the way th- we think of as love, right? I mean, isn't it ultimately the person we love, right? But in the dominant Roman culture that Paul lived in, um, what we think of as love was far from welcomed. In fact, actually, love itself was seen as a weakness because it hindered rationality. So when Romans thought about love, it wasn't wife. It was more like, ah, something's wrong with that person. He's weak. So we we can see this being played out in the Roman view of marriage and love because for them, the central idea that they would have come up with for marriage and love would have been faith or, or loyalty. That's the way they thought of as marriage. In fact, this is, the, this is actually what the Romans thought of, uh, and this is what they expected in a marriage relationship, in a marriage love relationship. Public support, but private coldness. That's weird, right? And, they would, and there was, a, uh, for instance, there was a famous uh, general, Roman, uh, Roman general named Pompey. He was very much in love with his wife, who was Caesar's niece, and he grieved her, when, uh, grieved for her when she died early. And you would have thought, well, that's great. People would have been talking about what a great guy he was. Actually, they, was, they snickered behind his back because they saw it as a weakness. Roman, loved, uh, uh, lo- Roman love valued showing public support, but husbands and wives were normally cold and actually distant. And this is why, in contrast, Paul insists that being church is being loving and not in the Roman way. This is really the proper extension of what we were talking about last week, about building a gospel-shaped church by cultivating a culture of grace. And now we see this idea expanded, and Paul says, you must have sincere love. Ultimately, a gospel-shaped church 
uh, that has truly a culture of grace will express itself by being truly loving. Imagine, uh, imagine that. Just think about what that means. To truly love one another. To not be like the culture. To not be like this world. Even though, uh, you know, we, we, now we were over, you know, inundated with love. Paul's talking about something specific. It's about the love that comes by us receiving love from Jesus and by loving God. And we translate that by sharing it with one another. And this is what he's talking about. Imagine that, because that's important. This is why, and this is why Paul reminds us, and in fact, being church is not just about loving, but it's being devoted in brotherly love, he says. You know, not just about your personal uh, closest person. It's about honoring those others who are lower than you to be higher than you. This is different. This is not the love that 2,000 years ago the common person walking in the street would have known or would have expected or would have even lauded. But this is all changed because of Jesus Christ. Indeed, uh, these are powerful. Uh, for Paul, being church and, and being and loving was not an idea. Being church by being loving was how people lived. This is Acts chapter 2 all over again. This is that church. And you know, we, today, when we, whenever we read Acts chapter 2, I know our reaction is like, wow, that's so, that's so different. It was different. Not just today, but really 2,000 years ago. It was really different. And that's why being church, for instance, Paul says in Romans chapter 12, 13, share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. These are not throwaway lines. These are not, are you good at hospitality? These are not, do you have a lot? He was saying, be that very different, loving person that Jesus has freed us to be, both in truth and in, in fact. These were powerfully subversive and revolutionary ideas back then. And I want to suggest to you that they remain so even today. And when people of God focuses on being church by being loving, then our entire church becomes transformed. And, and this really is what transforms also our worship as well. This is gospel-shaped worship. When people start loving one another and, and, and we make love the thing that really motivates us and desires toward God, desires toward one another, that transforms the worship, which is our everyday life. And indeed, this is why Paul urges us he says in uh, Romans chapter uh, 15, continuing in verse thir- uh, 11 and 12, he says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Again, not very Roman values, right? And, and today, even today, think of, the, think of the hard and harsh world in which we live. It's the Bible, it's God, it's Jesus Christ. It's this community, the new community that the Holy Spirit began 2,000 years ago on Pentecost Sunday. It's this community that introduces these ideas, these, and they're not just ideas, like I said, these realities of transformed lives. And it's this that changes all of culture. This isn't something that just happened and we just happen to be a part of it. Far from it, folks. It's the Christian church that innovated and introduced love the way we now understand it. Right? This is why Paul urges us to, to, you know, to say, be patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. But Paul's saying is, hey, being church, it's working. Not being church is work. Paul's saying, it works, it's working, it's happening. And the Holy Spirit is at work here among us, even today. If, if Paul, Apostle Paul were here, that's what he would say to us. And as we start loving one another and, and, and receiving love and sharing love and, and, and being intentional and self-sacrificial, all the things that come not out of duty, folks, but that other subversive, revolutionary love, the love that Jesus Christ showed us by going on the cross, dying on the cross for us. And we think of it as just paying for sins. It's not, folks. That's love. Right? That's love. 
It's the love of the mom who sacrifices. It's the love of the dad who works that extra shift. Maybe moms too nowadays, especially moms. Right? It's, it's the love of a sibling for the other. You know, I, I, I go to China for mission trips. And one of the most amazing stories I often hear from so many of these families, especially the farmer families, is that they choose the one sibling that they think has the best chance and the other siblings go get jobs so that this one sibling can have a chance. And, and it's so liberating when we bring the love of Jesus Christ and they start to finally understand what that impulse is really about. It frees them. And it, instead of putting a burden or instead of saying, I don't want to do any more, well, I, it actually says, wow, that's what it's been about. Love is revolutionary, and the love of Jesus Christ, the love that Paul talks about, that we, sh- we should be sharing, it changes hearts, and it changes lives, and it's important, and it's powerful. The dominant culture of Paul's day was forced. This is the Roman Empire. The dominant Roman Empire culture was forced to re-examine and ultimately to completely change love. Now, if that could happen, imagine... The power of love today as we are being church by being loving. I really think that that same love will not only just transform us, I think that's the best chance we have for this culture, folks, the world that we live in. And being church all begins by you and me committing ourselves to sincere love for God and for one another. Do me a favor. Turn If you're sitting with your spouse... Turn to that person and say, I love you. Really, try it. (laughs) I'll start. I love you. I'm going to be sleeping on the sofa tonight. Um, Now, turn to someone who's not your spouse. Why are we... Just turn to someone who's not your spouse and say, I love you. (laughs) You know, we're laughing, but this is liberating. Isn't it? Right? We just did it for five seconds. Imagine. Imagine. The power. And we think of power as me being big. That's the world speaking. Real power is me being lower. Right? Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, Christians shouldn't think about becoming powerful. We should think about going lower. And I I believe that. I think he's right. Because I think he was talking about, and he was in tune with the Holy Spirit and what the Bible is saying. Right? Being church by being loving is such a powerful concept that even Victor Hugo, who's one of my favorite authors, uh, wrote about it in his book, Les Miserables. Speaking of, now he's not talking about a church, he's talking about a part of a church, the altar, but it sort of fits here. Just stay with me for a second. Speaking of what to him is the most beautiful altar, the, the character that Hugo's writing about says this. He says, the most beautiful altar... The most beautiful altar is the soul of an unhappy creature consoled and therefore thanking God. I'm going to read that again. The most beautiful altar, beautiful of altars, is the soul of an unhappy creature who's been consoled and now is thanking God. And how are unhappy people consoled? By being loved. Right? That's the best consolation, folks. By being loved by people like you and me in the church. For that is what being church by being loving can do. It transforms through loving care even the most broken people into the most beautiful of altars for God. And indeed, that's what Peter talks about. Actually, in uh, I think it's First Peter, so when he talks about, you know, understand you are the you are the, the rock on which, the, uh, not Jesus' words, you know, he says, 
It's the 12 rocks. He's talking about, you know, build an altar for his life. That's what Peter's talking about. This brings us to our second point, which is the second key description. I just got the two today. Love must be sincere. And so being church uh, is hating evil. In, in order for love to be sincere, love must hate what is evil. We must hate what is evil. We must cling to what is good. This is Romans chapter 15, verse 9. As we are now transformed, and this is a, the challenging part, into the gospel-shaped church as our worship, as our culture, as our very interaction gets changed, one of the, the strongest signs that we are headed in the right direction will be that we will start to hate evil and cling to what is good. Hate evil and cling to what is good. What does that mean? Paul's picture of hating sin and evil and cling to what is good is one of the most practical instructions actually we can find in the Bible. It actually has uh, uh, this idea. Hate, the word that he uses for hate, imagine uh, everyone has strong magnets at home. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? If you turn it on the ends, the, the, the poles, the same poles, and you try to bring strong magnets toward each other, what happens? Right? Can you, can, you, can you do it? If you're a really strong person, you might just do this, but you can't. So the word that Paul uses for hate what is evil is actually revulsion, repulsion in that sense. Right? We are to, and this, this, this is something that happens as, again, love takes over. And when love takes over, when we see what is evil, we will have this reaction. And in many ways, the sadness of our culture, folks, is that when we see what is evil, as Roman, Paul talks about actually in the beginning of Romans, uh, oftentimes we live in a culture that we don't just tolerate evil, we approve people who are doing evil. And Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, we invent new ways to do evil. To be sinful. And, and, and we, we call it anything we want. But no matter what you name it, it doesn't change the facts, folks. As people of God, we are supposed to hate evil. And then there's that cling word. It, the word cling here is actually glued. And actually, the, the, the verb that Paul uses is, anyone ever go hiking? Anyone, any hikers here? Okay, one hiker. Good. The visitor. <laughs> Thanks for hiking in. <laughs> what happened? I, I, I grew up on the East Coast. I did the uh, um, uh, AT over here with the Pacific Coast Trail. Uh, after a day of hiking, what's covering your body? We all know this, right? Dirt. And the funny thing is, that dirt doesn't come off. I mean, like, it's, it's weird. You could try to brush out your, uh, your, your boots. There's some dirt that never comes off. And so actually the verb that Paul uses uh, when he says cling to what is good, it's what he's saying is he's using the same verb like that, the dust that clings to you after a long, hard day of hiking. We're supposed to cling like that. To what we're supposed to hate, be repulsed by, and repulse what is evil, and we're supposed to cling to what is good. And th this is the image that, uh, that, that Paul uses. What is evil? Evil is opposing God's holy commands. Evil is ending up somehow doing the exact opposite of what God tells us is good. Evil is putting ourselves in front of others. Evil is becoming wealthy beyond description without any care in the world for God's word and God's command that we should care for the, the, those who are lowly and suffering. Evil is when we say that we don't need forgiveness. Because we're good enough. Because we're smart enough or rich enough or powerful enough or self-sufficient. Evil is when we say to God, despite whatever we may say with our mouths, in our, in our hearts, we don't really need God or I don't need God. I'm, I'm, doing go, I'm doing okay. Folks, that's evil. That's evil. And out of that heart comes evil deeds. Right? That's what evil is. And, and no matter how you cut it, the, 
Jesus is clear about this, by the way. Uh, Lord's Prayer. He teaches us, and we, we talked about this, and I said I didn't have time, and so I'm sort of coming back to this one. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. He says, Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The, the key of understanding what Jesus is saying here is that Jesus is saying, pray to God the Father to forgive us. But actually, when you read this closely, the sin itself is never acceptable. The evil itself is never accepted by God. And the force of the sin is forgiven on us, but the, the, the actual sin itself remains exactly what it is, in opposition to God and rebellion against it. Right? This is, this is the reality of sin. The good news is that through Jesus Christ, He will redeem the worst of sinners. Sinners as sinful as me. I, I, I'm not proud, folks. Actually, I am proud. That's my problem, actually. <laughs> you know, I'm a wise, wise acre. I'm, I'm proud. Uh, I, you know, but God will even forgive me. And God will forgive you. Through Jesus Christ, God is ready and able. He's willing to forgive all of our sins. And that's the good news. That's amazing. And that's what we're supposed to practice. But only in the context of what is right that God shows us. Think of what is happening when we hate what is evil and cling to what is good. As Paul reminds us, only then will we discover just how being church trans transforms us from this hateful attitude of power and oppression it's really the most freeing experience. It's the most liberating thing to finally say to God, okay, God, you win. You win. I'm going to see what happens when you win. I'm going to put myself in your hands. And I, want to, I, I want to be the church. I want to be the church to one another. I want to be the church to my family at home. I want to be the church to, to my co-workers, especially to those who don't know you, but to everyone. I want to be the church. I want you to win. And I want to put myself in the background. I think that's what Jesus is talking about. I think that's what his prayer is about. And I think that's the second, that's what being church is about. It's hating evil because we are filled with something better. And that's something better is the love of Jesus Christ. Um, this is why it's the gospel of Jesus that frees us. This is why we can be joyful in hope. See, if we're filled with the same old sin, what is our hope? Right? We've got no hope. This is why we can be patient in affliction. When we suffer, when we go through the, the worst of times, this is why we can be faithful in prayer. This is why we can share with God's people who are in need. This is the true basis of hospitality, folks. It's not about our giftedness. It's not about us being good at it. It's about us being freed by God to finally say, okay, I'm going to try to love you. It's, it's not easy because I'm not very good at loving, but I'm going to just, I'm going to give it a shot. That's what this is about, folks. And it goes even further than that. Paul says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. This is, this is what happens when we let go of sin. Right? This is liberation. This is true liberation, folks. As we bring home our gospel-shaped worship sermon series, uh, this is ultimately what true worship, life of worship looks like. So much so that as we fully commit to being church, uh, I think God's going to free us. And, it, it, and I think, and I, I see signs already. We're transforming because God's transforming us. And we're going to be that church 
that's not no longer you know worried about oh geez we can't you know we can't let anyone in we're good I, we, we need to become because not only is it right it's, it's what's going to save us folks we need to become the church that saves others by sharing jesus by having an open chair in our small group meetings by having an open heart when we see people in need by understanding that compassion what that means is to feel with that person the experience that they're going through and to feel for that person. I began uh, earlier with uh, my story about uh, Lemmy Saab. The character, by the way, I, I recommend you read that book. It's a great book. But uh, the character that I, I was talking about is Monseigneur Benvenu. That's a, sort of a joke name. They call him Monseigneur Welcome because that's all he does. And actually, it's sort of funny. It's, it's one of the more comical sections where the people in power get upset at this man because instead of using his privilege like the other, monsi- like the other bishops did, he would use his power, what? To, to help poor people, right? In fact, the first thing he does when he becomes a bishop, he comes to the, the hospital and he says, there's been a mistake. You have enough room for six people. I've got enough room for 60. You're in my house. Get out. Go live in that house. And it really upsets the powerful people, right? And that's why to him, you know, that altar, the most beautiful altar is the the broken soul that's been consoled by God and now is thanking God. It all fits. And of course, now, how many people saw Les Les Mis, the movie or the show? Then, and only then, after that, we meet the character that sort of describes that situation, Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean is a thief. He comes into the bishop's house. He steals the silver. You know the story. You know. By the way, if I ruin the story for you, I'm really sorry. Um, but there's more. You know. But rather than condemn this thief, Monseigneur Bienvenu frees him in Christ. And actually, that's not quite the truth. He frees him to Christ, and he sends Jean Valjean in off into a world, but he says this to him. And this is the thing. And this is what, you know, hating sin and really loving is really about. And and you probably heard this. He says, Jean Valjean, my brother, you no longer belong to evil, but to good. You no longer belong to evil, but to good. Right? If that's not the practical application of, or or the, the the basis for hating what is evil and sinful. I don't know what it is. He says, you no longer belong to evil, but to good. It is your soul I buy from you. I withdraw it from black thoughts and the spirit of perdition. Perdition means loss. You know, it it literally means going to hell. So he says, I buy your soul. I withdraw it from those blackness, which, you know, means evil and of, of hell. And can we read the, can you read the last part? And let's read it together. And I give it to God. And I give it to God. What a beautiful picture. Multiply this picture by the number of people here. And the number of people who are meant to hear that message through our being church by being loving and hating evil. And, and, and you, have, you have the church, this church that God wants us to be. This beautiful, gospel-shaped church that lives at the local level and, and, and shoots for the eternity of Jesus Christ. Friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, um, we got... We got a lot of things that co- that's coming ahead, and, and maybe this is the, I sort of announced it ahead, but you know, this is, this is not easy work. I mean, there's a lot of complexities. You know, we have a journey, including the journey about our congregational decision about our uh, Presbyterian Church USA uh, affiliation. Uh, is, is that our future? Is, maybe it is, maybe, or maybe God's calling us to another Presbyterian denomination. I don't know. That, that's up to us to pray about. But the way we do it, and the fact that we do it, it, it has to be powered by, and, and, and led by, and motivated toward the 
the love that we get from Jesus Christ, the love that we love, lift up to God the Father, the love that we have for our neighbors to speak truth as well as to, to sacrifice of ourselves. That's what being church is. That's the church that I, I want us to be. That's the church I dream about. That's the church I fantasize about. And I think that's the church that we can, we can work toward together. And that's the church that I think being church is really about. Amen? Let us pray. And as we pray, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward as well as the worship team. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to now meditate upon your word. Speak to us. Remind us that it is you who invite us and empower us to love. And it is your very holiness that frees us to hate what is evil. Thank you, Jesus. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let us now